Ah, oh, dig that crazy groove, man. <laughs> hey, welcome folks to the first session of Innovation, Domino's live podcast series focused on innovating your e-learning strategy, tools, teams, and processes in ways that drive your business in outcomes for your organization. I'm Chris, Chris Van Wingerden here, Linker. and Brent. Um, and Brent, it's been a while since we've done something like this. Boy, it's taken us too long to get here. Mm -hmm. and I, I hope everybody that's here hanging out with us today uh, has, uh, has anxiously awaited the arrival of our, our new show. So thank you all for joining us. Yeah, it's so cool to have so many folks joining us um, as we you know, left our, our previous lives behind in our instructional designers and offices drinking coffee series, um, coming up with this innovation series. And we're so glad that folks have joined us here today. Um, our goal with the innovation series is to help connect this many silo organizational improvement. We all know that organizational improvement isn't a one-time event. It's a constant and ongoing process. And we hope innovation helps bring the world of learning and development and training together with the world of performance support and knowledge management. If you're listening to the audio version of this, you can sign up for our live sessions at any time at domino.com slash innovation and wait for it we have to spell it i n k n o w v a t i o n because here at domino we're all about the little word puns right nothing gets spelt obviously <laughs> you can't say no uh, without no exactly or something like that <laughs> weird um Brent's bring, sorry guys, today Brent is bringing us a really fascinating conversation about bridging and even in combining those, even combining those worlds. Um, Brent, tell us a bit about our interview guest today. Yeah, absolutely. So we have Crystal Vesley uh, as our guest today, and we had a fantastic conversation that we're going to share with you shortly, but I'll, I'll set the stage a little bit um, as we've been talking about uh, all of these different items, right? Combining um, all of the work that we do as instructional designers, as corporate training professionals, as communicators uh, in uh, in the world of learning and development, the higher world, higher you know level of the organizations that we all work in, there's all of this digital content creation that needs to be done, and there are a lot of different organizations that do it. And I was curious to find out if anybody in my network uh, had um run into the same obvious aha moment and had started you know doing anything differently are they connected to their knowledge management team and their learning and development team or their corporate training team like how are they working together are they working together is does knowledge management play a role being connected to learning and development and whatnot and i don't remember exactly how i phrased it but uh crystal popped into the comments of my linkedin and she was the only person out of many 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 comments that said, yes, we are, are, I do manage the knowledge management team, the training team and the comms team all under one umbrella. So I reached out to her and um, she has an amazing story to tell and she really has uh, had the opportunity to create uh, what I what I called in our in our marketing of this, the, the dream team in my eyes, uh, you know, everybody has these organizations, but we're not really too sure if they're all working together or, uh, you know, so to be able to pull them under one umbrella, I thought Crystal is the type of person I want to have a conversation with. And um, and I want to share that with our larger community and our larger network of folks. So very cool. Yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to hearing hearing your interview. Um, folks are joining us here live. Feel free to drop questions or comments into the questions panel. We'll keep an eye on that as we go. Um, in, in, between, in between interview sections today, we'll do our best to catch up on those comments and ideas too. So um, Brent, I think it's time to meet Crystal and, and hear the fir first part of your conversation. Let's do it. Let's get that started. 
Hi, Crystal. Hi, Brent. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks. Thanks for joining me today. We uh, we have a few things we want to talk about today about um, learning and development and knowledge management. And you and I uh, first connected on LinkedIn, I think, and you were one of the few people that has uh, the pleasure of dealing with um, both in your current job. But Maybe before we get into that, you could kind of just tell me a little bit about your background and and share with folks, you know, how you got into this spot. <laughs> well, I sort of tripped into learning and development the same way that probably a lot of people do, right? I was I was in the business, I was I was doing the job on the front line and in financial institutions is my background. I'd, I'd been uh, working in financial institutions for a number of years and. Um, you know, just through the course of ha landing in a position that required me to sort of bounce around and help and support in different locations, I started noticing a lot of inconsistency and in how we were doing things from one place to the next, right? And I was asking questions. Why are we doing it this way? What, you know, at this location, they're doing it this way. Why are we doing this differently? And, and got a lot of you know, shrugs and well, that that's just the way we do it, right? Yeah. So, so I think it was my quest for uh, consistency and just getting the right answer, right? I wanted to know, well, what's the right way to do it, and then I'll do it that way. So uh, that that sort of caused me to be interested in uh, a position in the training team when it opened up. I really had no background in, in training and learning, um, no, certainly no background in knowledge management. And, and uh, truly through, the, through uh, spending a number of years um, sort of blindly trying to help train others, I, I uh, cultivated a, a knowledge base of um, actual methodology and, and understood that there was Hey, there's a rhyme or reason as to how we do this uh, effectively and uh and yeah so landed uh in a space where now i get to not only help uh, train others but then also help kind of collect and and disseminate uh, knowledge for others as well and and obviously the two go hand in hand a lot of the time yeah so let, just to clarify for folks what so what is your role what is your your current job yeah, so I currently lead a, a three different teams uh, in a financial institution. Uh, I get to lead a team of knowledge management specialists, and that function, I get to lead a team of folks that are, are instructional designers, right? The folks that are building those learning activities and, and pushing them out. And then I have a training delivery team. So anything that's instructor-led, those folks facilitate. And, and specifically within my organization, I have responsibilities for that from an operational standpoint. So our, within our retail network and our operations network, uh, our learning function is, we have an enterprise learning function, and then my learning function is more job specific. Gotcha. So you are you are under operations. You're not under HR. I'm not under HR. Really, for the first time in in my career in learning and development, I'm not under HR, which is is definitely a, a shift, uh, and and has lots of of positives um, and some things. I've, it's taken a while to get used to as well. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I was just gonna say. I mean, that it seems to be the two different places in our industry where where training and knowledge needs to be managed or or handled or there's just there's there's work that has to be done and so you're either at the enterprise level under hr or you're in operations right. doing you know just just doing that learning and that knowledge stuff that we do now i remember in our early conversations um you actually the team wasn't actually called a knowledge management team right it was it's a comms right. team and a training team and then a training delivery team. Those are sort of the three uh, groups. You right, made. and and truly b before I came to the organization and pulled together this structure, uh, we had actually, I think we were calling what now is my knowledge management team, I think we were calling them operations development. And they had a number of different things in the um, other duties as assigned uh, category. <laughs> they were they were helping to create and maintain our knowledge base of, of operational policies, procedures, and just 
knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, and then they, they were also helping with a number of other things. If we if we were testing uh, new processes or systems, they were involved in that, pulling together um, internal use forms and some other things that I, we've since sort of shifted to other more specialized areas so that this team could really focus on capturing that um, operational knowledge and, and being the stewards of that knowledge. And then, uh, but we did not have a an internal design team or a or focused delivery team. We had folks who were sort of embedded in the business who were given that as a primary job function. Hey, you're going to focus on delivering training for these folks. So when I came on board, I had had the uh, opportunity and, and was given the the grace and the trust to um, really sort of recommend what's the best structure based on the areas of responsibility you'll have with knowledge management and communications, internal kind of uh, job related communications and, um, and, and needing to support some, some job specific training, what should this look like? And so that's really where we I, I kind of uh, identified that there's really three s sort of um, separate but absolutely related functions, disciplines that are happening here. Let's, let's, you know, get the the right folks on the right seat on the bus, and I really did luck out. A lot of my team members I inherited from other places in the business, and got to know what their backgrounds were, and and uh, ultimately um, was lucky enough that they really aligned well with this structure. Yeah, it, it's just it's amazing because I don't. Um, I've always you know, thought about this structure before, and I've had conversations with other colleagues in L&D throughout the years, right, that, uh, talking about, you know, how all of, you know, these different disciplines come together, and um, there are other conversations and articles written and discussions that happen around the different, you know, the different uh, things that we do as learning and development professionals, and which has, you know, expanded over the decades, right? We don't just create training courses anymore we now because of our skill set and doing e-learning and and developing those self-paced courses we've also gotten pretty digitally savvy and so then we we do kind of get pulled into creating not just e-learning content and courses and whatnot but we we you know we can create um you know just basic you know heck documentations we are we're good writers so we we right. write good specs right or at right. least you know most of us you know at least we should be uh you know as as instructional designers and whatnot but um I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day and i just i remembered reflecting back when we used to roll our eyes at um you know requests to to create documentation or to uh you know to just share information throughout the thing and we would always right. roll our eyes and just say that's not training that's not what we do that's comms that's a communication right that's not right. a training that's a communication and we would always want to push it over onto the communications team and i can remember right. business people scratching their heads going well, why not i you know they, they right. don't understand the difference you know right well, and frankly, the lines are really blurry a lot of the times, to yeah. be honest, right? It just depends on the complexity of the message and the readiness of, of the person receiving the message. Uh, you know, something that seem seemingly is a simple communication to a particular audience about a change in process. Yes, that may be appropriate, right? That that might be a simple communication, but in, in many cases, it's more nuanced than that. And instead, there may be certain portions of the audience that uh, maybe this is a bigger change for them. Maybe it is more significant for them. And because of that, we need to help supply them with some context or perhaps even some prerequisite skill in order to then execute on what we're telling them in this message. So the lines have always been very blurry. And, and to be honest, um, one of the things that I have noticed off and on throughout my career in learning and development is that it's always important. It, it has always been important to make sure that we are partnering well with our folks in operations, whether we're embedded in, in operations or not, we've got to partner well with them, with the individuals who are subject matter experts who really understand all the ins and outs so that we can have that thorough understanding of what the processes are in order to be able to support that and, and provide learning activities that help enable the, the performance of those processes. 
Yeah. But the journey to get there is really uh, winding. <laughs> it's not a straight line. <laughs> and so, you know, if we're not really partnering in a collaborative way with the individuals who, who are the stewards of all of that information and sometimes coaching them so that to make sure that, that they're getting that documentation put down in a way that's understandable by the end user, yeah. then we're going to have a much harder time being successful and actually creating meaningful and effective learning experiences. So it's, it's always been really interconnected. Some of us just are lucky enough to be close enough to the business and to the individuals yeah. who are documenting those things that we can uh, much more organically uh, get the information that we need and, um, and ensure that it, it's going to make sense. So let's pause right there. Chris, what struck you in that first part of the conversation? Um, the whole structure of being operations rather than in a siloed other department, for instance, uh, you know, hopefully that makes what, she, what she's doing easier, you know, puts her in the core of something, uh, it, you know, as part of the actual conversations leading up to changes, et cetera. I, I did like her line, the journey is winding, it's not a straight line. Um, and so that's, uh, that's going to be interesting to find out uh, as you go on in your conversation with her. Just was she able to straighten that line out at all, or, or how did that work out for her too? Yeah, we move on to the next uh, the next part of our conversation. I um, I believe I asked her just that about uh, the process and uh, and what happens. Let's hear what she has to say about uh, unwinding that line. So hung up on we just create training. That's just that's what, what that's what our that's what our team does. You know, right. we, you're working on those other. So how does that process work? That's what I'm really curious about. I mean, obviously when you came in, there was already a, a bunch of knowledge artifacts. You know, right. in various locations, various mm -hmm. software systems, all of that kind of stuff. There was there's probably an LMS. There were probably a lot of existing right. training. Like you you come into this, you know, probably looked like chaos. And, you know, you're given this responsibility to to kind of make this work and to formulate this. Like what's what's the first thing you do besides pulling the team together, like from a process perspective, right? What what how does that happen? What what happens next? Right. So in my case, I, I took a look at it and had to do a bit of a chicken and egg analysis, right? What needs to come first in order for us for us to be able to really um, actualize the, the vision that we have here of creating really effective training that supports job performance? And one of the first things that I noticed was that I was lucky enough to be able to reference a, a pretty significant inventory of knowledge content for that team, right? That they had a process in place, they had been documenting a lot of things over a number of years. One of the challenges with that though, was that the process that was in place made sense to individuals who'd been with the organization for a long time. The, the logic behind how it was organized, how it was written, um, how it was being presented to end users, really wasn't something that, uh, for somebody brand new coming in who's needing to look through all of that material and, and make sense of it all. Uh, it just wasn't conducive to being uh, super user friendly and intuitive from that perspective. So I, I took a look at it and realized that one of the first things, one of the first large undertakings that our team was going to need to do was completely reimagine how we were writing, organizing, and delivering the knowledge content for our end users. And so we spent, uh, gosh, the better part of a year going through, taking inventory of what we had and applying information mapping methodology to the process, which is hugely helpful. Uh, they're not paying me to say this, but I, I will share that uh, I think since I initially encountered and was trained in information mapping like 12 years ago, um, it there are absolutely components of that that I have used in my career since. So um, if, it's, if it's not a concept you've uh, heard of before, I would highly recommend checking that out. In any case, one of the key tenets of information mapping is really just sort of parsing out content based on 
the purpose of the content, right? So if this content is uh, maybe a list of guidelines or policies, then you know maybe this goes over here. But if it's something that's intended to instruct someone how to complete a list of steps, well, that's a procedure. And so that needs to sort of live separately. And we need to be very purposeful about how we write good policy because there's certain ways to do that which is different than how we organize and write good actionable procedures uh, if we have definitions we need to create then, then that's a different sort of type of information and then chunking that out and and uh, pulling together things that are relevant ultimately applying that methodology really allowed us to completely rewrite we mapped over all of our content that we had and we identified from what we had okay here's what this type of content is we'll create a separate document for that and templates for that and so we were able to take this huge inventory of uh, hundreds of documents frankly uh, that were all written in a somewhat narrative way that was sort of inclusive of all of those types of information right topic based we were able to take that and break that down so that when someone is looking for information and they just need something in the moment of need right which is most of the time when people are accessing knowledge bases they're doing it in the flow of their work right so they need to be able to just get to the information they need we were able to take those multi-page large documents break them down based on information type so now when people go into our new knowledge center and look for information they're not going to find a 30 page document that they have to sort of scan through to find the one bit the few sentences that they need instead they'll be able to go to separate libraries for those purposes we've been able to because we broke it down we've been able to uh, really optimize the search functionality with keywords um, and so it, it creates a space where people have been much more readily able to find just what they need right in the moment of need and then carry on with their job uh, which is, is what they want to spend the majority of the time working on right they don't want to spend 30 minutes looking through a knowledge base and and then forgetting why they came into the room <laughs> they want to get yeah. that knowledge and apply it. okay so you know kind of an unplanned pause here but i think it's really important to the this this last part that she just talked about what 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 struck you about it chris um <laughs> fascinating that the and not surprising but a process of remapping things was about a year-long process so we know it's not an instant you know, flick of a switch and big ships, you know, change direction slowly too. So, um, and what a bonus that she had a team in place that was actually amenable to this and able to be, you know, transferring its skills and, and, and changing that way. Yeah, it's, it's the thing that strikes me and that is, um, I, I think that I mentioned in the interview segment was that most of us, uh, well, a lot of times we just don't feel like a lot of this work, this prep work, this setting up of the information and the knowledge, and and uh, and organizing it in such a way to make, uh, to give folks the ability to, you know, to to get the information they need when they need it, right? Bob Mosier, you know, famously, uh, you know, crafted this with Conrad Godfordson and talking about the five moments of need and and starting there. And I think what people don't kind of understand is that a lot of that work is done with the knowledge management team or the comms team. There's there's content out there, and I I just I find it to be um, in a, a very very interesting strategy that she's taken on to start there right and to or get all of that organized first in order to then build a solid foundation for the types of training that comes up next that we talk a little bit more about uh um you know down the way so we've talked a little bit about um the commonalities uh amongst those groups and how they work together and how she got started in the process so uh let's let's pick up on uh, some of the differences yeah yeah i mean you you've said a lot of buzzwords that are really good i, I wanted to kind of touch on i mean the whole the whole knowledge base or the knowledge center is an is an important um you know, hub, right? For that first point of of 
needing that information right. that you need in that flow of work. And it all seems kind of, as I'm talking through it and hearing you talk about it, right, it all starts, it seems obvious. And I, I really want to break this down, but I keep thinking to myself, this is so obvious, maybe I should just move on, you know, within the conversation, right? But then I keep thinking, no, if it was so obvious, everybody would be doing it. So, right. so maybe we do need to break it down a little bit more, right? And it, it's like um, some of the things that, um, that, that go through my mind when I'm thinking about this is, you know, what, so, so we're talking about how the two are coming together, right? Have we got, mm -hmm. there's a lot of knowledge. You did some analysis mm -hmm. of everything that exists. You categorize it, you give it some right. information mapping, right? Now you've got it all in the right chunks. You've got a nice portal, I guess would be a good word to use or a hub, uh, you know, knowledge base where people can come in and access it. Right. So how do you then define the difference between that and what maybe your training and your instructional designers do? Right. Right. So we've got uh, all the commonalities. Now, what are the differences kind of? Where right. do you draw that line? Even if, even though we're in a gray area, where does that line get drawn? Right. Uh, th that's such a great question, right? Because it is an absolute gray area. And I think that the line in the sand uh, maybe it's just as simple as thinking of the content and our knowledge base as very passive, right? It's okay. there. It's there for people to leverage it when they need it. Uh, it's there for them to reference, but truly just by its existence or by people visiting the knowledge center doesn't necessarily mean that they have gained new skill and can now uh, complete new job tasks, right? They may be able to, if it's a, a fairly simplistic skill and we've done our job of writing the content particularly the procedural content in a way that is intuitive and easy to follow great but when I think of training I'm really thinking of we're talking about a series of learning activities where people are getting to engage with the content purposefully engage with the content and through the completion of purposefully methodically designed activities they're then acquiring those skills they're getting the opportunity to try those things on and hopefully that culminates in then a, a, a collection of new skills that they can uh, immediately apply apply on the job yeah and then that that knowledge base of 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 information steps just regular content then becomes support material right so, source yeah. material exactly exactly and that's that's what's so great uh and and one of the best benefits that i have of the fact that i i have responsibilities for both of those worlds it um, enables us to have some synergy in places uh where we wouldn't otherwise and case in point is you know, when we have a, a big change that's happening within our organization, we know that there's a lot of things that need to take place to prepare people for that change, right? And I, I think of myself in the people change management business, right? I'm enabling Ooh, like people to be ready for change. Like so, that. you know, when we hear about a change coming in, I will bring in my head of our knowledge management team. I'll also bring in my head of our design team because I want to make sure that we're all thinking about this change from both of those perspectives. Um, is there something that needs to change within our existing documentation or do we need to create something net new so that anybody who needs to reference information about this change has a place to get it? But at the same time, I'm also asking my design leader to think about all right, so from a from a people change readiness perspective, what are these people going to need? What experiences are they going to need to help prepare them for this change? And to your earlier point, sometimes, again, depending on the complexity of the change, the scope of it, yeah. it may be something as simple as, you know, we'll just document it really well within some operational policies or procedures. And then we'll send out a communication letting people know about it. Great. I can let my ID manager continue on with her redesign of, you know, various job specific training programs and, uh, and, and we're good to go. But in other cases, it's going to require that additional intervention. Uh, and, and so it's, 
so wonderful being able to look at it from both of those perspectives because if we do need to tackle it from both sides i can make sure that both of those trains are on the same track not just moving in the in the same direction but they're on the same track uh, right. we can leverage resources from each other and um, it, it just sure makes life uh, a lot more efficient when we can all be um, going in that same direction without having to then uh, kind of compete with other priorities from other outside business units. So what, what stuck out for you there, Chris? Anything in particular? I, I, uh, I love the, you, you added the comment in, in the question panel or the chat panel there too, but um, it's not about knowledge management. It's about changing behavior. It's about uh, managing how you change people's behavior or how you encourage that, et cetera. Uh, and the idea as well that, that she kind of views the knowledge as passive, right? It's waiting to be activated. It's waiting to be put to a purpose that might be just as something that helps in a time of need. Oh, I need this one task. I'd never, never need to do it again. But if it's something that you need to use as a skill over time, there's more than just a, uh, you know, a document that you're going to have to access. You're going to need some practice and retrieval, for instance, et cetera. And those contexts are so important. Yeah, and, and just having all of that information and being able to create those, those different digital artifacts is important. The, the next segment that we, um, that we jump into here and discuss is, um, uh, you know, how, how do we define success or how does she define success and move forward? And um, it, it does have a lot to do with um, what we've already talked about, which is that that different um, being in that different spot, um, HR versus ops, which is a, is a really interesting part of this conversation. How do you separate what you do as as this team in operations from the training team under HR? How, how does that work? Like a new hire comes in, I'm assuming the HR does onboarding and whatnot, but then where right. it, is there a handoff or? Yeah, yeah so uh, that's a great question, Brent. And, and uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about the pros of having our function, our job related training function embedded in, in the operations world and the business versus in HR, you've sort of uh, struck one of the potential cons of having um, a, a sort of um, disparate kind of separate team uh, that is not a consolidated learning function. And that is that sometimes those lines do get blurry and sometimes the handoff isn't as smooth as it could be because it's sort of a Okay, are you are you getting this? I kind of like to think of it as, um, you know, when you watch a baseball game and you see a fly ball go out into the outfield and you you're watching a couple players and they're both headed towards the ball and you're hoping somebody calls it, right? So yeah, it, and then they it's both a little stop bit and the ball uh, drops. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like that, right? Because there is sometimes that that question of, oh, okay, is this is this my area? Am I going to catch this? Is this you? Would it? And so it really just involves some communication to make sure, sure. that um, you know we're we're talking with each other hey is this do you feel like this is something that's that's in your lane is it in my lane because sometimes it is a little bit blurry right and yeah i think what enables us to be able to get kind of keep that train on the tracks keep moving forward is that communication and um you know also requires a little bit of um a an abundance mentality instead of a scarcity mentality right there's uh there's plenty of work to be done if we don't care about who gets to own it or who gets to take the credit and we just care about getting the work done, then we're going to be successful. And that's definitely uh, helped um, ease some of those pain points of yeah. right, what's in your lane, what's in my lane. Yeah. So how do you define success with the business? Like when you're, um, you know, looking at like, what is the impact that, that you know, our, the work our team is doing? how how do you define that yeah i i think one of the again going back to some of the benefits of being embedded in operations is is that you get to really be focused on business outcomes and we know in the learning and development world we've all been told how important it is to make sure that we truly understand uh when we get asked for a training and intervention you know, what are your 
big outcomes you're looking for? What are the performance outcomes you're looking for? We, we understand that. But when you get to focus on the job specific training uh, for your lines of business that you support, that means that it's often easier to get more objective goals from an intervention, right? So from the initial consultation of asking, all right, you mentioned you wanted some training around this. Talk to me about ultimately what you're trying to achieve. And then we can figure out if training is going to meet that need or not, right? Yeah. But right from the outset, I think I'm uh, more easily able to get much more objective um, goals that we're trying to achieve, which then I can much more easily translate to Okay, so what performance do you need from the people in this line of business in order to meet that objective? And then, of course, we can create uh, much better learning objectives around that in order to meet those needs. So I think it actually makes measuring the success of our interventions much easier because we have uh, there's KPIs we can point to, right? There's there's um, pretty objective uh, metrics that, that we're looking to help shift and support versus sometimes when you are focused on perhaps some of the more soft skills, gosh, it's harder to be able to truly demonstrate here's the difference we've made and anything more than anecdotal you know, stories, right? Uh, hey, we've noticed, we've observed that this seems to be happening better. We have an opportunity to really say, well, we had a goal of uh, selling, you know, or having an increase uh, in sales of this product by X amount uh, within this promotion. And look, we, we got there. And, and the business got there. Yeah. So I'm probably jumping in a little bit more than I wanted to, but I wanted to clarify and separate a couple points that she's talking about here for folks, because it just dawned on me that um, that uh, the the idea of her being so authentic about there's problems and that there might be issues with this as well. It's not a perfect world, right? I mean, I we set this whole thing up with that uh, you know she's got this great dream team and and all of that and working in ops is so much better than HR, but it does have its issues and it can, there are things you have to consistently and constantly work through. And I just wanted to highlight that for folks and, uh, and just make that clear. Anything else different strike you there, Chris? The measurement factor. So many of us in the L and D world struggle to get past smile sheets. And uh, being operations focused though, means that she can tap into those KPIs and see changes you know, way beyond just the satisfaction scores. Yeah, it, which is huge, which is huge. You're right. And the, those are concepts and, and things that we talk about all the time, right? Getting a seat at the table and I, we want to be made important and being connected to that operation seems to, um, you know, and, and having those hard, um, you know, goals and easy things to measure because the business is measuring the HR and soft skills. It's a little bit more difficult to, uh, to, to get that, and I, and I think that's what a lot of us struggle with. But um, we take kind of a left turn here in the in the in the conversation, and um, I go I dial us back a little bit and ask her, um, you know, what was the problem in the organization where they decided to do this, which is uh, another fun part of this conversation as well. At the risk of taking us too far back to the beginning of the conversation, one of the things I did want to ask you that I that I forgot about was what what if there was a business problem that the company uh, was trying to solve when they decided we need to bring somebody in to do L and D in operations and do these other things or, or whatever they were doing before, what made them say we need to do something different and bring you in? Yeah. So I think it really boiled down to a couple of things. Um, one is just the recognition that our larger kind of enterprise learning function, just like any enterprise learning function, they have to wear a lot of hats, right? They're sort of expected to be all things to all lines of business. And uh, all of those lines of business, they're, they're sort of like baby birds chirping, feed me, 
right? <laughs> and there's just a lot to do aside from those uh, soft skills and the you know new hire and hey let's onboard folks let's let's get them some regulatory training. Um, there's just so many different job functions and each of those requires a different level of support. So um, the fact that in my world our retail function and our operations function um, has a significant volume of new hires, that they make up a significant volume of the business, uh, it, it made sense for there to be a more dedicated resource that could then focus their efforts on the ongoing kind of performance related, job related training so that uh, this team, because there were so many of them and we, uh, you know, bring on new individuals on a, on a pretty uh, regular cadence, it just made sense to invest some additional resources for that size of the business so that uh, we could meet the, that volume of ongoing need, but also so that we could help, and this is really primarily where I have been focused, so that we could help with the ongoing uh, change-related initiatives after they, they leave that initial kind of new hire training where, where you, you get that initial competence, right, at the, at the you know, base level of a job, but I get the opportunity to help grow people and and really help them gain um, the the knowledge and expertise to ultimately master their roles. Yeah, taking from competent to do the job to being right. great at the job and and performing at a higher level. Getting, right. right. Getting getting them getting them up to speed um, more quickly by being able to pull all of the diff all of the different elements together that um, that that make up an individual's learning journey in right in a job yeah. right exactly and and truly from that change perspective as that journey continues because even once you master a role things change right new sure. processes new systems are introduced um, I think one of the the biggest benefits that they were looking to uh, to see from bringing me on and having me kind of create this this specialized team is so that we could be most agile when those changes happen right we rather than needing to sort of prioritize the changes that are taking place in the business against all of the other lines of business and everything they have going on from day to day uh, my operations and my retail leaders can come to me and say hey specifically within our group the things that are impacting our folks here are some changes that are happening how quickly can we get something pushed out there to help support and enable people to be ready for this change? And inevitably, it's it's much easier to do that when you when you have a dedicated group focused on just your your line of business. Yeah, it's it's almost like you like even though we're talking about this from like a you know there's the knowledge management side of the team, there's the delivery side of the team, and then there's the you know the design and development you know part in the, in the three teams. It, it's almost like though in general, really, it's the performance, improving the performance right. or, you know, and so it's all of the stuff that is a part of that, all of the knowledge, the digital learning artifacts that need to be created, whether it's just a, a document or an infographic or a little performance support job aid right. or a full-blown training that, you know, that they need to go through or, or whatever. It is all of those things pulled together to just focus on the performance of those individuals. Does, right. that, does that sound about right? That, it, I, that is spot on. I couldn't have said it better. Because <laughs> I just started thinking about that. I'm like, you know, I, I I compartmentalize this stuff. And so maybe I'm one of those people that's part of the problem. But really, when you think about it, yeah, when you when there's a one department focused on that performance, that is where the real goal ends up being anyway. Right, right. Well, you know, you, you talk about the compartmentalization. I think, though here's the advantage of of the organization size that i work in right i i work in an organization that has roughly 2000 employees and uh but i have worked prior to, prior to coming to this organization i've worked for smaller organizations and i've worked for much much larger uber globo sized financial institution organizations what we're doing within my organization works for us and for now, but I'll admit 
should we double in size, would it still work the same way? I don't know. I can tell you that it certainly would not have worked in the much larger organization that I was in because, well, as you might imagine, uh, we're talking about a much, much larger uh, inventory of content. Um, it, it, of course, generally requires somebody to narrow their their scope so that they can have a deeper um, uh, focus on just those those components because you know there there is such a, a larger inventory of of work to be done right so yeah. uh, it, in those cases I think the compartmentalization is necessary but absolutely I think the collaboration sometimes gets missed right in the much larger organization I worked with I had um, at best an arm's length relationship with our, our actual line of business. In fact, many of the times there was at least one middleman, if not a couple of middlemen between my organization that focused on designing learning activities and the actual business that we were designing those activities to support. And while we uh, you know, had a, a lot of great collaboration in a lot of different ways, it absolutely put us at a disadvantage the fact that when my designers would start to build content or build training and maybe they had a clarifying question about but is this the best practice or is there a better way do we have power users that we can work with who can really give us um, the pulse of the frontline staff and how the work is really being done it was often very, it became very political and very different, difficult to get our hands on uh, that, that direct connection with the business sometimes. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think every organization based on how they're structured in general and certainly their size has to sort of take a look at what makes the most sense. Um, I, you know, I'll admit again, I, I feel lucky that I am in a, organization where this is working based on our structure and our size um, but uh, you know I don't know that it could be replicated everywhere this particular model yeah it's great insight that only comes from having experiences in in multiple different organizations because you can sort of think it through yourself as to how something might work in a in a bigger situation or a smaller situation you know if it can be done but until you're in it and you start to see all of the other dynamics at play it it is because i'm sure there will be a lot of people listening thinking to themselves this is great I, why can't my organization get on board with something like this and right. I, I think you're uh yeah, you're you're spot on as far as uh, as far as that goes. It doesn't mean that it can't be done. It's just that there are a lot of different things. I would say mostly cultural, human, people things that have to align yes. just right. Would that be a good way to explain it? <laughs> I could not agree more with that. That's so true. Because at the end of the day, whatever model you follow, what who who uh, or what business unit or what uh, area that the training function rolls up and reports through and the knowledge management rolls up and reports through, ultimately, whatever that structure is, the key is in being open to communication and being willing to be transparent with your business partners, whether they're in the same organization or, or they're in some other area of the business. Um, you know, I think back to my time in that much larger organization and we really, uh, while it would not have made sense to structure our knowledge management right there uh, aligned with and under the umbrella of, of learning and development, there certainly were opportunities for us to uh, be more effective in that collaboration, to be sharing information more readily and just to uh, create some awareness of what you know, one hand knowing what the other's doing and uh, and and ensuring that those checkpoints were were taking place along the way. So, you know, I, I don't know necessarily that the actual structure, the org chart, I don't know that that really is uh, the end all be all of the success of knowledge management and learning development working together. It's about the people in those functions and it's in the, the process they have to connect and collaborate. 
So I'm just going to uh, pause us right there because that that um, I remember when we were having that conversation and it struck me as um, as important, right? The process of connecting and how um, it it even though she has the dream team and she's been as she mentions, uh, you know, uh, blessed with the trust to be able to pull these teams together and to manage them together as a as a group, which seemingly makes it easier. That's really not the issue. The issue is the processes and the communication and be people being willing to share and work together for the greater good of improving the performance, right? Yeah, she mentions that maybe she's blessed by being able to do this in a smaller organization and, and the question sort of sits is is it something that can be translated out into larger organizations um, so maybe part of the answer to that is process as you've mentioned um, but maybe this is also more of a replication model right you're not maybe doing this at a full organizational level it's more of a operations departmental level etc so multiple teams doing this kind of thing which keeps the sizing you know at a manageable level or, or a, a level that can be actually carried out instead of massiveness you know getting in the way yeah yeah lot, lots to think about there and I, i'd love mm -hmm. to hear back from the community uh listening and and being a part of innovation and hearing how um, how this affects you guys and how, how everybody else runs into it. Looks like we have an yeah. interesting question too from, uh, from our Yeah, well, Janet's, Janet has posted a comment in the question panel. Um, she notes, performance support and improvement is a paradigm shift from regular training. And she's put regular in quote marks there. <laughs> We're moving that way at my, work, my workplace and it will take some time to get there, but it's exciting. Um, and even Crystal was talking about in your conversation just a minute ago, how this isn't about training, it's about training and moving them through the whole learning journey, right? Moving from from just onboarding to, there's a you know bit of a buzz phrase of everboarding, because she mentions change happens uh, and you still need to be able to communicate and, and keep everybody um, synchronized and up to date and understanding uh, and executing on change uh, over time. Right. That's that is uh, that that is always the most important part. It's a journey. It's a it's a learning journey for your employees that uh, that are that are coming through your organization. It's not just the onboarding. It's the everboarding, and uh, and um, and then what comes next after that. So, but uh, speaking of what comes next, that was my final question as I uh, wrap up my conversation. Uh, with uh, with Crystal is uh, is what does she see that's that's next? And uh, she has an interesting answer. Let's jump back into that. Fantastic spot for us to end this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't just have one more question, I just wanted to to get through with us. Like, what's next? Like, what what would do you like with what you've built and what you've got going? Is there any sort of like dream thing that you've been trying to to implement or pull off next or to adjust or you know goodness well i think for me in this moment in time helping to promote learning in the flow of work is really important and so as i think about the fact that i i am lucky enough to have uh, influence over our knowledge management how we're, we're approaching that then uh you know i've been cooking on ideas around can we explore um, AI solutions to help take all of this great stuff, this now very well organized and very well uh, defined information in our knowledge base, now that we've got this, this uh, better starting point, can we have some AI plugins? Can we then uh, you know, leverage that even better so that, and not to want to put you know, learning and development or training, uh, you know, out of work, right? But, uh, you know, how can we maybe save uh, our resources when it comes to building learning activities for yeah. those things that truly are the most complex, the most difficult, or the most high risk sorts of uh, tasks that people perform by making it much easier for people to get what they need in the flow of work, uh, leveraging AI. So that that's sort of what's in my mind um, we know of course from a security standpoint there's there's lots of uh, concerns there um, and working in financial services as i do that's even even more of a concern for us but yeah 
you know, yeah, if financial well, services can crack that nut, then everybody can jump on board. Right. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, you know, that's probably going to take a little while. Yeah. Uh, this was great, Crystal. Thank you so much for chatting with me today and, uh, yeah. and agreeing to talk about this. I, uh, it's, a, it's a hot topic, at least for me. It is, and it's it's something uh, I think we should all be talking a lot more about. So, um, if if anybody wanted to reach out and get a hold of you, what would be the best way for them? Oh goodness, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out. I would say probably finding me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Connect with me there. Chris, I think I'm uh, listed as Crystal Hill Vesley. Um, but if you you went into uh, Brent's list, you'd, you'd find me there as well. So yeah, I'd love to connect and idea share, uh, network. So feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thank you, Crystal. Thanks so much, Brent. We'll talk to you soon. Not too shabby of a conversation, I'd say. She hit on a lot of stuff. Yeah, really awesome. Uh, so many things to think about. Um, and, and what a uh, kind of privileged position, really, that she's in to have been able to do all of this. And it, it, it hits so many things that we in L&D always want to spike as goals, and KPIs that measure a, a, against organizational value, et cetera. Um, so I've been making some notes. <laughs> for sure. Yes, I think, uh, I hope everybody has taken a few notes. And like I said, it would be really interesting to hear what uh, what folks have to say. And, um, you know, uh, and, and I'd, I'd love to hear what everybody has to say too. So if you want to drop something in on LinkedIn or throw a drop a comment in on anything uh, else or, uh, you know, shoot us, a, shoot us an email or, or get in touch with us, that would be fantastic. Yeah, for sure. And if folks haven't already, be sure to pop over to the Domino website and uh, join the innovation newsletter and keep you posted on upcoming episodes. We're going to move at a bit of a different pace than we used to with instructional designers and offices drinking coffee, more of a monthly cadence to things, uh, keep things a bit more manageable. Maybe not quite so much of a fire hose of information coming at folks either. Too. So um, you can do that at domino.com slash innovation. Of course, innovation is spelled I N. K-N-O-W-V-A-T-I-O-N, if you're looking for it, or you can find it in the menu at the top of the website. Um, Brent, thanks so much for bringing us this conversation with Crystal. It's been pretty cool to hear what she and her organization have been able to do bridging this world of learning and development and the KM performance support world. Um, of course, big thanks to everybody who joined us here today. It's been a pretty, pretty good way to, to start out this new series. Absolutely. And uh, we'll have another one coming up next month for everybody. So stay tuned, get signed up at uh, uh, for the newsletter so you know exactly which Wednesday we're going to be doing it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback as well on uh, our new uh, our new format. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Chris, so much. This is tons of fun. I'm looking forward to the next one. Bye, everybody. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you.